I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 58 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 058. The gun of the show for this episode is kind of an odd gun for me to bring up as a gun of the show, but in light of in light of the lack of time I've had for this episode, it's very fitting. Now, I acquired this particular gun, which is a Rossi R243MB, as part of a trade. I have never actually shot this gun. I took it apart, I cleaned it, and then I put it in the safe. I did have a plan for it when I acquired it, but I had a better firearm become available that, well, it fulfills the purpose I got this one for, and this one has always been a safe queen, which is an odd thing when you consider the fact that it's a gun that had a sub $300 MSRP. Now, the thing about the Rossi R243MB that I have is that it was originally imported, or the entire run was imported by Brass Tech. Brass Tech was the original importer that was created by Rossi and Taurus to import Brazilian firearms into the U.S. But that's ancient history. This particular gun has a model number of R243MB. There is currently in production an R243MBS, which features a synthetic stock where this one has walnut. This firearm is chambered in the 243 Winchester centerfire cartridge. It is a single shot break action firearm, and the trigger is a single action trigger. The sights, well, from the factory it came with a fixed front and an adjustable rear. However, the adjustable rear was removed, a scope base and scope were mounted in place of it. And that all happened long before I ever got the gun. The material in this one is, well, it's a steel action with a steel barrel. The stock and forearm are made from walnut. It weighs in at a hefty six and a quarter pounds, and as far as MSRPs go, it's discontinued. But it's a cheap rifle that you can acquire relatively cheap today. In fact, I believe this one came into my possession as uh, to, to bring a trade into balance. We did a little horse trading, and it wasn't horses, it was car parts, and the fellow said, well, I'm going to end up owing you money. I'm going to end up owing you about 100 150 bucks. But I got this old 243 that, well, I bought it, and... I discovered I didn't like using a 243 for hunting. Said, well, what were you hunting? Prairie dogs. Well, yeah, I could see not wanting a break action for that. Yeah, we'll do that. And that's how I ended up with it. I was looking for something in the break action format just to mess around with, and, well, I got this. But then what I was intending to use the break action for, the situation changed, and the bolt action was more suitable, so that's what I ended up going with. Now, with that said, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the podcast. After that, we'll come back, and I'll tell you why this is going to be a very short episode this week. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, I have had a very busy week this week, and this is going to be a very short episode as a result. I live in Working Gaines County, which is where Seagraves, Texas is located. If you haven't been watching the state news, Seagraves is a small town with no nearby rivers or streams. The nearest lake is Cedar Lake, which is usually a mostly dry alkali lake. Now, the reason I bring all this up is because... Well, Seagraves, Texas flooded, and it flooded due to excessive rainfall on Monday. Now, I'm recording this on Friday the 8th, and it will be released on Sunday, May 10th. But when I, while I'm recording this, the city of Seagraves, or we call it the city of Seagraves because that's what they have on their letterhead. It's actually the white spot in the road of Seagraves, but Seagraves is still flooded in a lot of places. In fact, you could probably drive a block off the U.S. highway that goes down well, that defines where Seagraves is, and you'll end up submerged in places. And that's why this is going to be a very short episode, and there's no real news or announcements or listener feedback brought up for this episode. There was listener feedback, but I really don't have time to go through and vet it all, and I'm trying to get away from reading it straight out of, the news, uh, straight out of my news and email reader. So we're going to skip listener feedback for this episode and go straight to the social uh, the social media audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. 
You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, the topic of this episode is going to be kind of all over the place. Depending on who you ask, the Jade Helm 15 is a military exercise that is intended either as a training exercise or as part of an effort to declare martial law and confiscate guns, Walmart stores, and children's candy while installing President Obama as emperor for life and the rest of time. Now, Jade Helm reportedly takes place in Texas and a large portion of the Southwest, all the way, according to some reports, as far away as California. Now, what I find amusing is that much of the Jade Helm conspiracy theories fail to mention that this is the 15th one and that each one tends to be larger and more complex than the ones before it. And if the government were truly efficient, and truly what some believe is what they are trying to use the Jade Helm exercise to do, they would actually use Jade Helm to map out, plan, and further advance their evil agenda and take advantage of the infrastructure provided by the U.S. Postal Service for reconnaissance in order to get things done. The truth of the matter is, I do not really believe that anyone is stupid enough to try and installing martial law during Jade Helm when so many people are on high alert and ready to revolt in such an event. Well, maybe our vice president is, but there are actually too many people who know what really is going to happen if they try it that, well, I really don't think he'll get his way if he was one trying it. So basically, I don't think anyone with the ability to pull it off is stupid enough to do it. Do I think everything is face value with Jade Helm? Heck no. You have to keep in mind, I'm not one of these that takes what the government says at face value, but I'm not going to go jump off the bridge with all the conspiracy nuts either. I think the truth is somewhere more in between the two. I think there is something going on with it. I don't think it's what they say it is, and I don't think it's what the conspiracy nuts say it is. And yes, I do use the phrase conspiracy nuts. You see... A conspiracy nut is somebody that anytime something out of the ordinary happens, blames it on a conspiracy. And that's why I mentioned Jade Helm, because it's, while it's not really just a Texas thing, nor is it really firearms related on the face of it, the thing is, the same logic used to generate this conspiracy relating to Jade Helm is being used by some to come up with a conspiracy or conspiracies about the Texas legislature and gun bills. And the truth of it is, As far as I know, there's no conspiracy in the legislature. However, time is running out, and while it is running out, we are not out of time yet. And our legislation is in a good place to advance in a lot of cases. But let's look at some of these conspiracy theories about our legislation in the state house, or actually in the state legislature. Now, there are theories that campus carry was amended to HB 910 in the Senate to kill the bill, and possibly to get HB 308 passed. Other conspiracy theories I have been made aware of are that the parties in power are killing gun legislation to make OCT and or Texas carry looking capable in order to ensure they retain power in the legislature. And the parties in power that this particular conspiracy theory addresses would be the TSRA and the NRA. Now, another theory is that Democrats are secretly secretly doing something to keep the bills from advancing to help them get in power for the next session. Now, I too have a theory but mine's based on what's playing on the History Channel as I record this. And as a result, I'm going to say aliens. Now, Charles Cotton recently updated the Texas Firearms Coalition Bill Status Report, and we're going to take a look at four bills that I really have been monitoring pretty close. There's a lot more there, but in the limited amount of time I have to do this short episode, because I have got so many things going on this week, it's not even funny, let me say that These four bills are just a sample of the different bills that are currently being considered, and they show the various uh, positions for, or not the various positions, but the various stages that these bills have made it. Now, let me go out on a limb and once again say that all these conspiracy theories about the legislature, I'm not buying into them. I don't believe them. I don't think that we really have anything to worry about yet. After the legislature is over, We'll see what what all the holdups were and all that, but right now, let's not worry about what's holding things up. Let's worry about getting the bills passed. Some people might say, well, we got to figure out what's holding them up in order to get them passed. Not really. The, The real point of it is we need to figure out how we are going to go about fixing this. And the way we fix it is we wait for the NRA and the TSRA to put out a call to action, and when they do, we respond to it. 
And speaking of calls to action, I have an idea. I have a brilliant idea, and I am going to start working on it. This idea is going to take a year to a year and a half for me to figure out and implement a proof of concept. And when this proof of concept is released, it'll be part of what I'm planning to do with something related to the show. When this proof of concept is released, I'm going to turn it over to someone else and tell them, you try it out, and if it works, use it. There's going to be a prototype concept built, tried out before everything goes public. And I may call out to some of the listeners here, some of the ones that are regular, uh, res- that regularly email in. I would say every episode I have anywhere from 4 to 15 people that email me from episode to episode. And that's good. It's real good to have these people respond to you on a regular basis. But the ones that, uh, the ones that email in with things that really strike them, that stand out, are the ones that really stand out to me. The people that email me for the first time really stand out. And some of them will be the ones invited to do this. Some of the ones that are regular respondents will be invited to uh, try this. And we'll see where it goes. But hey, we're getting way off topic. So let's go back to talking about the four bills that I really want to touch on. House Bill 226. Now, House Bill 226 creates a civil penalty for governments and agencies that post unenforceable 30-06 signs. This one was placed on the House general calendar for the 5-12 of 15. That would be Tuesday of the next week. Well, Tuesday after this episode releases. And then we move to House Bill 308. House Bill 308 removes off-limits locations currently applicable for concealed handgun licensees as set out in Texas Penal Code Section 4603 and 46035. Now, it's in the Calendars Committee. However, on the Texas CHL Forum, which, if you're not a member there, I strongly recommend you go there. Pro-gunners, anti-gunners, um, open carry Texas, the legislature, all kinds of people read that forum, even if they don't participate. But anyways, Charles Cotton on the Texas CHL Forum says the bill is dead. And the problem is that when Charles says something, I tend to believe it. And by tend to believe it, I'm going to say 99.999999% of the time. There's a very remote chance he could be wrong, and I'm not going to say I believe him 100% because of that very remote chance that I may not believe him. However, once again, when I say something on this podcast and Charles Cotton says something, go with what Charles Cotton says. He's an old pro at this. He knows what's going on. He's in communication with everybody that knows what's going on. So I'm going to say bow to his experience every time that I say something that doesn't quite line up with what he says. And then we have House Bill 554. Now, this is relating to a defense to prosecution for the offense of possessing or carrying a weapon into the secured area of an airport. And this has actually been sent to the Senate. Now, if you'll notice, we have one that's on the general calendar for a specific date. We have one in the calendars committee, which is reportedly a dead bill now. We have one that's been sent to the Senate. And the next bill is in Senate committee right now. And that'd be House Bill 910. Now, there are reports there is a deal to pass this bill with campus carry attached to it. And essentially, this has caused quite a few conspiracy theories to be spawned, but we're not really interested in those conspiracy theories. Here's the deal. When this bill goes to conference committee, or when this bill is sent back and it's there, the legis- the author of the bill can call it up to a vote, bypass calendars and everything, and there's nothing the Speaker of the House can do to keep the legislation from being called up to a vote. So basically, a deal has been worked out, and I'm going to say with the author of the bill, the Senate, and everybody else, so that campus carry gets attached. It's already been ruled germane, and I suspect part of that is the amendment to keep campus carry and open carry from interacting and allowing open carry on campus inside of buildings and all. I'm going to say that amendment is how it became germane. But the House parliamentarians already ruled that campus carry is germane to open carry. So in other words, they can't say, well, it's not germane, so we're going to kill the bill here. Essentially, the author's going to call the bill up, it's going to go to a vote, and everybody in the House is going to vote yay or nay. And if everybody does what they're supposed to do, the yays will have it. The Senate amended House Bill 910 will be sent to the governor, and we'll get campus carry and open carry. It's a pretty slick maneuver around the Speaker of the House. And it's a good way to it's a good way to show Strauss, well, we'll find a way around you, boy. Just to go back into Southern speak there. But you know what? That's the beauty of 
these four bills. These four bills show the different places our legislation is currently at. And things can get fast-tracked if we really push and apply pressure. The key is applying that pressure when it's needed and pulling that pressure back when it's not. With that said, it's time to run the audio clip that tells you how to contact me and tell me how wrong, right, or crazy I am because I do or don't believe in whichever conspiracy theory you support. Or maybe it's because I do or don't agree with you on something else in the show, or maybe you got some constructive criticism or you want to threaten me, or maybe you just simply want to tell me I'm an idiot, or maybe you want to tell me you think I'm an, I'm a genius. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to tell me, you listen to this next little audio clip, and then you send me an email or you send me a, some other message. But everything you need to know, you can hear right now. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, this show wouldn't be complete if we didn't actually go into the talk of the talk of the nation and cover the one event in Texas that, well, has made national news, actually made international news. And the event was essentially viewed as by many as an invitation to a, a well, for some extremists to attack those attending it. The location is an illegal self-defense zone for concealed handgun license holders. The end result was two dead and one injured. The event was the Mohammed Khartoum Contest, and I know I mispronounced Mohammed, but I really don't care. The location was the Curtis Colwell Center for in Garland, Texas, which is owned by the local school district and reportedly posts 30 6 signage as well. The dead were the attackers, and the injured was a school security officer who was shot in the ankle. The security worked like it should. However, you know, it would have been better if we didn't have to have that security there. But let's let's look at a let's look at a different scenario, okay? While the security worked like it should, imagine that it didn't. Imagine that the officer that stopped the shooters wasn't there. Maybe he was two hundred feet away. Or maybe one of the attackers dropped him before he could drop either of them. Well, if that had happened and these attackers had actually made it into the building where the where you know there's security inside the building but let's say let's say this was more than two people or maybe they had actual military training to pull this off or maybe these guys were just really good and let's say they made it into the building and that you know they engaged defenders inside the building you know military law enforcement type folks but i don't think there was any military there i believe it was all texas law enforcement although some people will say the the police are getting a little too militarized, but that's beside the point. Well, let's say they engage those folks and they they overpower them. And let's say a few, if not, let's say a few of them survive that and they move on to start killing civilians. Well, the only other line of defense the civilians would have had would have been licensed concealed carry holders or licensed open carry holders or in other states, unlicensed open or concealed carry holders, depending on you know the laws of that state. But legal people that are legally carrying arms for self-defense would have been the last line of defense in this in this situation. And well, that li that last line of self-defense was not there. Now, the thing that really gets me about this: one attacker reportedly tweeted about the attack twenty minutes before they initiated it. That's how confident these guys were in what they were going to do. But the thing is, it looked like they were just going there to get killed which is exactly what happened. Now, the next story I'm going to touch on talks about the same event, but it, this one discusses the officer stopping the attack. The attackers were reportedly wearing body armor, and they were using AK-47 type weapons, and a lone police officer drew his pistol and stopped both attackers with excellent shot placement. The only good guy injured in the attack was an unarmed, let's, let me repeat that, an unarmed security officer who was shot in the ankle. Think about this. Think about this, okay? You have a police officer with a pistol. Reports are it was a forty-five caliber Glock. He engages two attackers wearing body armor, armed with rifles, and he stops both attackers. He is not injured. This man is a Texan. 
when you get right down to it, this police officer embodies the spirit of Texas. And he's not the only one. There are plenty of other officers out there that also embody the spirit of Texas. There are plenty of others out there who legally carry a firearm daily for self-defense who may or may not be law enforcement. They embody the spirit of Texas. And while some may or may not be able to pull off this attack, you know, pull off stopping this attack, you know, a lot of them are. It's good to see an officer that can, that can handle his weapon well enough to get the shot placement to stop people who are wearing body armor. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if we, after this is all done, we find out that this body armor was actually a tactical vest and that the 45 caliber bullet passed through the so-called body armor without really slowing down and stopped the attacker uh, as if, you know, the attacker was wearing paper. It wouldn't surprise me if that's what we hear. Because every time we see one of these mass shootings and we hear about body armor, it later turns out to be tactical vest. Tactical vests are not body armor. They may be marketed as such, but they're not. They're made out of nylon, not Kevlar. Or maybe they're made out of cotton. You know, I've seen a lot of different tactical vests that really don't do anything more than provide a lot of pockets. Well, some people say they look cool, but I don't know. But that's the thing. The video in the video in this story where we talk about the officer stopping the two attackers, it shows two attackers and it shows two police officers outside of a police car. And that's not really what happened. The video has got a lot of problems because this video reconstruction of the event shows two police officers. looks like they got sub guns, but you know, we don't really expect CNN to give accurate videos. Just saying. Hey, we got one more news story, and this one is in the miscellaneous category, and I was actually thinking about going and checking this place out. I'm not going to now, but I was thinking about it. SK Arms in Midland, Texas is the hot new gun store where you can get your choice of, net, you know, of basically NFA items. Now, they are so cool, they have their name and logo on the side of a Ford F-150 Raptor, and I'll throw in a link to show you where that, to show you that image, but yeah, they're that cool. It's also the place where after-hours horseplay leads to employees getting shot, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, alcohol was involved. Now, the news story is a local channel, and this is actually in my area. But the local channel says that video from the store shows they were sitting down, the one that got shot stands up, pulls out a knife, the other one stands up and draws his gun, they struggle for the gun a little bit, and the one that stood up first with the knife got shot. And if this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen in a gun store, I don't think I want to go there. I don't care if it's an F-150 Raptor that they have their logo and name on the side of, or if they're in the corner of a strip mall, or if they have a 400-acre compound with bunkers of guns and ammo. I don't care. If employees are going to be able to have alcohol involved horseplay on the premises, I don't think I want to go there. But hey, that's just me. Anyways, this has actually gone on a little bit longer than I thought it would, but it's still a short episode. So let me say I would like to thank the NRA, the TSRA, their state reps here in Texas. I'd also like to thank Charles Cotton, all the membership of the NRA and the TSRA. I want to thank everybody that's acting like a sane, reasonable adult in getting this legislation passed. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. After show comment, I in the while I was recording this episode, I tracked down and eliminated the noise of a hum that some people might have heard at the start of the show, but it disappeared probably two thirds of the way through. The reason for that hum is I had a desk lamp and it was sitting probably a foot away from the microphone. Well, that desk lamp had one of these CFL bulbs and it was making a lot of noise due to in the through the microphone due to proximity. 
I reached over, I turned it off, and the noise went away. The reason I bring this up, that was the only thing that changed in my podcast setup, and it's the only thing that I could attribute the noise to. Even though I was going through, I was doing the podcast, I'm looking at the equipment, looking for something that I may have changed and forgot about, and nothing about the equipment changed. But something that was seemingly unrelated to the equipment had changed, and that seemingly unrelated item was causing the noise. It was causing a problem. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when we're looking at the state legislature here in Texas. Something seemingly unrelated may be the cause of our problems. Who knows? But anyways, thank you for listening, and please carry responsibly.